Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board and the Nebraska Soybean Board. Animal agriculture is vital to Nebraska. Livestock production not only contributes to our food supply, but also helps our rural communities. Livestock provides revenue for schools, creates jobs, supports Main Street, and enhances the future for farm families. The Nebraska Soybean Board's Animal Agriculture Initiative works to encourage growth of responsible livestock enterprises to benefit agriculture and Nebraska. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board and the Nebraska Corn Board. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Mike Briggs looks at the latest cattle inventory numbers. Tamara Jackson Zims updates us on southern rust in Nebraska. Tom Hunt shows corn rootworm damage. Frayne Olson analyzes grain markets. And Charles Shapiro outlines research on phosphorus use in corn production. Mike Briggs is our cattle market analyst this week. The USDA's July cattle inventory report shows the total number of cattle and calves in the U.S. is up 2% from a year ago. It was the first July increase since 2006. The agency's cattle on feed report released the same day tallied Nebraska's inventory as the highest since tracking began in 1994. We talked with Mike Wednesday morning and started by asking about the expansion in July's inventory report. Not really to me because if you just look at the economics of the retention of a, a heifer and turn her into a cow and the return on the cows right now, it doesn't surprise me. We had lots of green grass, lots of opportunity there for people to retain heifers or buy cows and that's kind of what's going on. So the, the fact that the inventory went up didn't really surprise me at all. What does it mean long term for the industry in terms of rebuilding the herd? <sighs> Great question. Well, we've done it in two pretty big chunks here last year and this year, so you're getting pretty close. and it, I think that that margin in that, it, that segment of the industry is going to narrow and that'll slow down. I, I, I anticipate it'll slow down. It's going to give us more supply of feeders as we go forward and anytime you have supply, well, price is going to go down eventually. In that, sorry, go ahead. No. I didn't want to interrupt you. I'm sorry. I apologize for my manners. In that cattle on feed report released the same day, we saw that Nebraska's inventory was the highest July one on record since 1994 when they began tracking the data. Does that surprise you at all? That did surprise me because as you look around here, we have some empty pens. I understand a lot of other people have empty pens. I had at least a thousand head of cattle run by me Monday for sale and every single one of them penciled out a $200 head loser. So I don't see anybody filling up real soon, although somebody's buying those cattle at that, that, way, that way. But it's pretty shocking to me that there's that many cattle on feed this time of year, because typically there isn't. Yeah, the last time we talked, you were hoping that maybe we were approaching a seasonal low in the markets, but it doesn't appear that hit. I think we maybe did last okay. week. I think we put in the seasonal low. I think we're done with that. Um, now, how far and how fast we go is gonna be the, the thing. I don't know how far we can go because part of the reason we're in the problem we are today is we got too high to begin with. The prices in the retail case are just horrific. We've got terrible export demand and export demand's not going to change in my mind till you see a change with the dollar. And I don't think you're going to see a change in the dollar till they raise interest rates and I don't think they're going to because I don't think I, I think the ice under our economy is a little thin. So that was long winded, but I, I just don't, I don't see it. So. What's happened here is because we got prices too high, as they say, the cure for high prices is high prices. So we've got this down now, and the good thing about that now is the retailer has huge margins. Beef is 8% cheaper than it was last year, yet retail prices are 10% higher. So you've got a pretty good margin in there. And as we've talked about for years, most beef moves on feature. Well, there hasn't been any beef featuring forever because it's been too high. Well, now you've got a, a a supermarket that's got a margin, he can start featuring and we'll, I think we'll start seeing some more beef move and we'll pick some demand up as we go forward. But I don't think you're ever gonna see the prices that we saw previously. Those market prices, how are they affecting margins? There's huge lo losses going on in the feed yard industry right now. And it's probably been going on since the middle of June. 
and they got large this month in July. You know, there's a lot of two, three hundred dollar losers. So you're losing a lot of that equity that you built up over the last 18 months in a pretty big hurry. And I fear if we don't adjust a little bit here, we're we're going to have a problem. How has heat affected performance in the feedlot? You know, if you were prepared for it like we were, where we have sprinklers or you have shade, I think you got through it okay. If you did not have shade and you were in part of the state that didn't have any wind on some of those days, there were some fairly significant losses, and that's, that's always disappointing. Luckily, I think the heat may be over for a little bit, or at least the severe heat, so that'll be good. And we'll have a look at grain markets later in the show with North Dakota State Extension economist Frayne Olson. As we told you in last week's episode of Market Journal, southern rust has been confirmed in Nebraska. The number of counties with the disease has now quickly moved into the double digits. Earlier this week, we talked with Nebraska Extension plant pathologist Tamara jackson zims near scribner to learn about the importance of accurately diagnosing and, if necessary, treating southern rust. I wanted to make sure everyone was aware that we have indeed confirmed southern rust in several Nebraska counties. And it's not to say that it's widespread and certainly not to cause panic for anyone, but we definitely want to monitor it very closely and especially for spread to new areas and for increased severity in some fields. Is this early in the year for the disease? It, it is. It's actually the earliest that we've seen it in a number of years and that's alarming for a couple of reasons. One especially is that we have so much late planted corn that's very early in development, making it especially more vulnerable to this disease. Any other risk factors or high probability areas? Well, in, in particular, it's mainly the, the uh, early planted corn that's a little earlier in development. So we have a lot longer window of grain fill ahead of us. And so just keep in mind, southern rusk is a very aggressive pathogen, and this is one that can increase very rapidly in humid conditions like we're having. And so we certainly want to monitor that. Okay, what does this mean for treatment options? Well, there's a few things to keep in mind. And so southern rust can be managed very well with the foliar fungicide. But if you're hoping to manage it with a single foliar fungicide application, it's important to know that fungicides that have already been made can wear off in approximately 21 days, just about three weeks. And it can take up to several weeks for southern rust to develop and become widespread. And so if a fungicide hasn't been applied yet, I would recommend holding off and waiting and watching and seeing where it develops, monitoring especially your own fields. And also to uh, keep in mind the fields that were treated weeks ago, or we have to watch them closely too. How hard is it to tell the difference between common rust and southern rust? It, it can be quite tricky. And so we talk about things like looking at spore color. We, we talk about southern rust being orange to tan and common rust being reddish or brown. But realistically, unless they're side by side, it is extremely difficult. And even for us, I'm not comfortable talking about it or differentiating it until I see it under the microscope. And so people send in samples to get confirmation and then we'll light the counties up accordingly. Let's move into northern corn leaf blight. How widespread is it in Nebraska? Well, northern corn leaf blight, we've been talking about it for a number of weeks now. It hasn't gone away. And in many locations, it has actually kind of slowed down or stalled out as temperatures has become hot. Now, as uh, temperatures become hot, it slows down. It does not kill it. And so as temperatures cool off again later, we could see it ramp back up again. Is that another one where you need to be careful about when you're treating? A absolutely. And so uh, as temperatures increase and slow down northern corn leaf blight, the, uh, the other side of that is that we see gray leaf spots starting to crank up because it really also likes the humid weather and warm conditions. Does the fungi fungicide application for northern corn leaf blight also cover gray leaf spot though? Yes, it does. And so most of our foliar fungicides, especially ones that have two modes of action with both a strobal urine and a triazole have some curative activity to stop early infections and also the strobal urine to stop infections on uninfected leaves for a few weeks up to about 21 days. How do you know if it's valuable enough to treat? And so a few risk factors I would look for. And so if you have a sensitive or susceptible hybrid, that means you have the potential for developing more severe disease. I would also look at the stage of the crop. And so earlier stages, especially it's, if it's at right around tasseling or shortly thereafter, that's pretty early. And so you have a lot of grain fill left. Other risk factors for gray leaf spot and northern corn leaf blight would be continuous corn or no-till. And so you have higher risk in those situations. Tamara says it can be difficult to identify some of these diseases. She therefore advises producers to submit samples for an accurate diagnosis. 
Most of Nebraska's corn crop is faring summer well. Nearly three quarters is rated good to excellent, according to the latest USDA progress report. But you wouldn't know it by looking at one of Tom Hunt's research plots near Concord. Severe rootworm damage caused severe damage and reinforced why many farmers use resistant technologies or treatments. We talked with Tom Monday to get an update on aphids and soybeans and learn about corn rootworm pressure in his test plots. This year was one of the highest rootworm pressure in our studies and trap crops we've had in a few years. Um, it just goes to show you can have a couple years where you don't see much pressure and then boom you have pressure. Is there a reason for that? Um, yes, uh, we do plant a trap crop uh, which, which can mimic some farmers fields. Generally those are late planted or late maturing varieties of corn and plus possibly weeds. Last year it was so rainy our weed control wasn't very good in the trap crop and we planted late maturing corn and so those rootworm beetles love pollen, they love you know late maturing corn pollen, they love weed pollen and if those weeds are in the corn they stay right there and lay loads of eggs. So we had a, a large deposition of eggs and then the weather was pretty good up here for uh, it didn't get saturated soils, so rained a lot so they survived. And what kind of damage did you see in those untreated areas? We saw uh, first of all when we did the root digs we saw some uh, heavy damage to the roots but also we saw extreme goosenecking and even flat corn. Um, goosenecking is when they eat the roots away so that it's loosely held so when the wind blows a little bit they fall over and then grow up again and then some of the flat corn is when they got fairly tall without goosenecking we had some very strong winds with very um, small root masses and they blew to the ground and then kind of the tips started growing up so it was very severe damage because of the extreme rootworm injury and then the extreme winds that came along later. Comparatively, what about those that had resistance or were treated? The, we have a variety of different uh, either genetics that are transgenic or against rootworms or uh, insecticide uh, treatments and uh, most of them did pretty well where you know the corn is still standing. There is some uh, lodging. When you have extreme pressure like this, um, even uh, some soil insecticides, there'll be some places where they, the, they'll get past it. It's kind of like uh, overwhelming numbers. So what does it tell you about the efficacy of these tools? It shows me that uh, the transgenics uh, in our fields work quite well and if applied correctly the, the soil insecticides are still protecting your corn pretty good too. Do farmers need to know anything about next year? You know you said that they might not be there this year but they could be there next year or in fields such as this? Yes exactly. If this year was a year where with the rains are some late planted fields. Late planted fields will attract rootworm beetles later in the season when they're laying eggs because they're eating the pollen. And then if you had problems getting weed control in those fields, that'll even add to the problem of bringing in corn rootworms. So those later planted fields, late maturing fields, particularly if there's weeds, will be the fields that next year you really want to make sure you have a good rootworm management plan in. Let's move into soybeans. Have you been seeing many aphids in this area? Uh, we haven't seen large numbers of aphids, but there are aphids in every bean field I've been in at this time. They're at relatively low numbers, but they have been increasing. There was a storm with high winds that kind of knocked them back a little bit, kind of what blew over some corn too. Uh, but, uh, so, but they are in just about every field, so it's time for farmers to start scouting, keep scouting, check them once a week, use that 250 aphids per plant, plus you know populations growing threshold. Um, we might get through August without having to treat, but I, I imagine some fields will need treatment. Yeah, how deep in August do we go where we don't worry about treating anymore? Um, generally, the aphids leave the, the fields in early September. Um, and if you get into R6, once you hit R6, um, it takes many more aphids to cause the same amount of damage. Uh, we don't know the exact numbers, but I double the threshold of more like 500. Once you get to 6.5, you know that's you don't have any more problems with aphids so they'll but the thresholds of 250 per plant hold all the way through R5 and so I'd keep watching them all the way through August and maybe a little into September. On the Market Journal website we'll link to more information on scouting and treating soybean aphids. We also have a look at grain markets this week with North Dakota State Extension economist Frayne Olson. Frayne joined us Thursday morning to dissect corn, soybean and wheat markets, but we started by asking for his thoughts on current crop conditions across the United States. Well, if you look nationally, in particular focused on the Midwest, uh, the crop conditions seem to have stabilized right now and of course that's putting some downward pressure on, on prices. The expectation is that any kind of yield drag may not be as, as great as we have expected. Um, the weather forecast, extended forecast as we look forward, 
uh, call for pre pretty much normal conditions. Um, so even though we've had some problems, not only getting the crop in, but at least getting the crop established, especially in the, in the southern and central parts of the Corn Belt, um, the northern and western parts of the Corn Belt have a really nice crop coming right now. And so the stabilization of the weather forecast is really helping put, uh, put a little bit milder tone into what we're looking at for prices. Let's go through each of these three markets and let's start in corn. What right now is affecting corn, which is comfortably sitting below $4? Yeah, and, and of course we've had quite a nice rally uh, in the month of, of July. Um, we've had this now retracement. And, and of course the rally was because of the concerns on the production side. Um, we, we have a comfortable margin uh, from carryover stocks from last year in the corn, but those carryover stocks are not necessarily burdensome. Uh, at least that's not my, my look at it. And so we still need to have a pretty good corn crop in order to, to maintain price levels. So the expectation now that the price, that the weather has turned, that hopefully as we go into August, there won't be any major heat, heat problems, any drought problems. You know, that's putting some, some building some expectations that the uh, corn yields may not be as bad as we thought they would be. So total corn production, it, even though there's still a hotly debated topic, um, we'll wait to see again what happens in August. Let's move into soybeans right now, also sitting below $10, although the August contract is flirting with it today. What do you think is moving this one? Well, again, very similar to corn. Uh, there's a lot of focus right now on kind of the yield expectations, what kind of average yield we might be looking at. August being a critical month for both flowering and, and pod set on the soybeans. Um, the other thing that kind of impacting or spillover is kind of the large crop that we've had in South America. Some pretty stiff competition in the world market right now for exports, especially into the Asian markets. The currency values are kind of favoring some of the South American um, shipments rather than North American shipments. So as, as we start move transitioning into harvest, I think we'll start to see some of our export pace pick up. The big question is, will it pick up to a levels that we really need to get rid of a fairly large crop? How big of a deal is what's happening in China right now and the spillover we saw to the U.S. stock market earlier this week? Yeah, psychologically, it's, it's a big deal. Um, you know, again, there's a large portion of the investors that we have in the, in the commodity market coming in from the financial community. Um, they start looking at what's going on, not only in the finance, but also in the commodity side of things. And their mentality, their psychology about what they think the future will bring can have a big impact on, on grain prices. Um, when I look at things, I think they, they have a fairly short view of kind of outlook um, and, and time frames. Um, from a market analyst, from a production side, I'm looking at it a little bit longer term. And I think fundamentally the, 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 the U.S. economy in particular, but even some of the Asian economies, um, are not as um, vulnerable as I think some of the stock market numbers have, have uh, provided or have shown us. Let's move to the last commodity, and that's wheat. Where do you think wheat is residing right now? Well, uh, to be very honest with you, I hope we've seen the low in wheat. Uh, <laughs> we've, we've seen a very large retracement in wheat. Again, the expectation for a long time, we were concerned about the production numbers coming out of the winter wheat belt. Um, there's still some quality concerns, but it looks like the yields were about where the trade was expecting. Uh, we're getting some crop quality tours here in North Dakota going on now, and it, we've got a fantastic wheat crop coming. Lots of bushels, very good quality. We may have a little bit some protein issues, but um, it looks like at least in Northern Plains, we're going to have a very good wheat crop. And that's putting, again, some psycho psychological down pressure under the wheat. Next week, Elaine Cub will join us to look ahead at the USDA's August crop report. In the July Nebraska Farmer, the Nebraska Beef Council's Director of Marketing, Adam Wagner, says when it comes to reaching today's younger audience, it's going to take some new strategies. In July's issue, you can read about some of the new ways the Beef Checkoff is reaching millennial consumers, including conversations on social media, interactive online tools, and smartphone apps to keep them connected at the grocery store. During our trip to Concord Monday, we also talked with Nebraska Extension soil scientist Charles Shapiro. Through multi-year studies, researchers there are looking at phosphorus use in corn to determine if higher rates improve yields. We started our discussion with Charles by asking about the purpose of phosphorus in crop production. Well, phosphorus is one of the essential elements, of course, and it's involved in the metabolic processes, the growth and the energy. You may remember from high school uh, biology or something, ATP, it's involved in that. Uh, from a practical point of view, it helps the plant grow early. It makes grain. Uh, so that's part of That's why we use it. Tell me what you're looking at in terms of how much is useful to corn production. Well, for the last 50, 60 years since they invented soil testing, 
uh, the big question is when you should add phosphorus or not to the soil. And we've done a lot of work over the years to calibrate that. Uh, the university recommendation is a 15 number. And, but not everybody agrees with that. So we started in the year 2000 to answer the question, can you get higher yields if you build your soil test up higher? With new yields going into the 200 plus range, so everyone said, well, you, you, know, you did that in the 40s and the 50s, you know, it's a new world now. So uh, we have uh, various check plots, but we basically have a 15, which is the university, a 30 and a 45. And then over time, we've put on phosphorus to maintain those soil test levels, and then we just grow the corn. What's the difference in those three treatments that you can notice on plants? Well, we have uh, some examples here. And where we don't put any phosphorus, it's stunted. The traditional phosphorus uh, deficiency symptom is a purpling. We don't see that too often, but when we look at the plants, you'll see that they're smaller, they're not as green, uh, and they're not as far along in maturity. It's really hard to see a 10 bushel difference in a plant, but uh, I pulled out some plants, one from the university uh, recommendation and one from that 45. And what's the difference in those two? Uh, I can see a little greener in the 45. It's a little bigger. Uh, it's not that far ahead yet, uh, just about tasseling. Uh, but what we really want to look at is at the end of the season, how much phosphorus it takes and what the yield differences are. So what do the results show? Are there clear differences in the treatments that you're looking at in yield results? Yeah, we're finding, of course, that where we don't put fertilizer or we only put nitrogen, uh, the yields are depressed. And the difference between the 15, the 30, and the 45, we get them some years. There's probably a five, six bushel difference between the university recommendation and the very high phosphorus rate. Does that lean you to go off the university recommendation or no? Uh, no, because we, we put on a lot more phosphorus to get the three bushels. Now, if, if you are a cattle producer and you're giving me the phosphorus, I would go with a little higher level, but uh, it takes about three times as much. So when this is dry land, it's not the best soil. Uh, we average close to 100 pounds of P205 to keep that 45, and we're averaging about 33 for the uh, Bray 15 university recommendation. So five bushels, 60 pounds of P205, uh, you know, it all depends on the prices. Now with this week's weather forecast, here's Nebraska Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well folks, here we begin for the weekly forecast. During this past week, we did see a scattering of thunderstorm activity across the state. Primarily the focus was in portions of south central, central and east central Nebraska and then also into northeastern Nebraska. We did have a little bit of precipitation last weekend across the southwestern part of the state, but we did have some blanketed areas where we didn't receive any moisture, particularly most of the panhandle north central Nebraska and isolated pockets actually of southwest, south central and southeast Nebraska. In between those, we did have some heavy precipitation, and of course some of that significant moisture fell in the Hastings Grand Island area, and also along the I-80 corridor up between York and up to Omaha. So we have seen precipitation, but the overall concern has been that we've seen a recent drying trend starting to materialize across western portions of the state, and the most recent drought monitor has included some abnormal dryness conditions developing in portions of the extreme western southwest part of the state, southern panhandle, portions of south central and southeast Nebraska. Now if we continue this dry trend, particularly over the western part of the state, we would normally expect to see an expansion of that abnormally dry area to include a greater portion of the southwest and southern panhandle. We're not talking about drought yet, but if this pattern continues into the foreseeable future, then we would have to seriously consider an upgrade to drought conditions, particularly in those areas that have been persistently dry for about the past couple of weeks. Now there is moisture in the forecast, primarily affecting more of eastern Nebraska than western Nebraska, but as with all of these systems, any south southward and southwestward movement of these troughs that have been moving into the Great Lakes region, then we could see that thunderstorm activity persist into portions of western Nebraska. Let's take a look at the upper end models and see how we think this week's going to progress. We have the ridge to our west and we have this trough to the east, and so we have a narrow channel between these two systems, and that's where the forecast for thunderstorm element for this afternoon is in initiated at, basically moving from north central through southeast Nebraska, particularly during the overnight hours and some of that lingering into the early morning hours of tomorrow. Uh, it looks like isolated or scattered thunderstorms, not widespread coverage, but at least there is a chance for some, some moisture in some isolated areas. As we get into tomorrow, we'll see that ridge trying to build a little bit farther to the east, but we're still looking at that channel between these two systems that would primarily impact the eastern half of the state. The western half of the state under this ridge doesn't look to have any significant chance for 
uh, moisture in the form of thunderstorm activity. Now as we go into Monday, we start to see a system coming in the Pacific Northwest and that's going to move rapidly toward the Great Lakes region and bust down this ridge. So we do have some moisture in place, but we're not seeing much in the way the models indicating any significant precipitation at the surface. Maybe an isolated thunderstorm in the far northwestern part of the state where we get into some of that monsoon flow moving in from the southern southwest up into the periphery of the top of this ridge. Now as we get into Tuesday, the system rapidly moves across the Dakotas. So we are expecting some widespread severe weather in the Dakotas. Some of that may actually shift its way southward to include northeast and north central Nebraska, but for the most part it looks like most of the scattered thunderstorm activity will remain to our north. As we get into the day Wednesday, that ridge moves over to the Great, or the trough moves over the Great Lakes, the ridge starts to rebuild back in with heat, When we see that moisture channel around the periphery of that ridge putting most of eastern Nebraska once again in the chance for scattered thunderstorm activity, and that will continue on to the day on Thursday as we see that ridge pretty much stagnant and we'll see the systems basically moving around the top of that ridge in initiation thunderstorm activity. And that trend will continue into the Friday with even a bigger ridge building up, bringing more heat into the central United States. So the 8 to 14 day forecast indicates that we are going to be looking at very warm conditions across the western part of the state. Most of the thunderstorm activity will be in eastern Nebraska with a cooling trend toward northeastern Nebraska. The 8 to 14 day forecast keeps cooler than normal conditions in as we get into a northwest flow. And with that northwest flow, we're initiating quite a bit of precipitation across the central plains. Thanks, Al. Today's interviews are available on the Market Journal website and through the Market Journal mobile app. They include information on cattle markets, southern rust, rootworm damage, aphid scouting, corn soybean and wheat markets, and phosphorus use in corn production. As always, you can keep up with Market Journal during the week on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Next week, Elaine Cub will analyze grain markets, and Dave Aiken will discuss land lease renewals. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board and the Nebraska Soybean Board. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board and the Nebraska Corn Board. When we transform Nebraska corn into ethanol, it doesn't disappear from the food supply. It just takes a little detour. Ethanol is made from the starch. The rest of the corn becomes livestock feed to create meat and dairy products, corn oil, sweetener, and other food ingredients, and maybe a little carbon dioxide to make your soft drinks fizzy. Homegrown ethanol helps satisfy America's hunger for energy and the world's appetite for feed and food. Nebraska's family corn farmers, sustaining innovation.